continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, where once again we concern ourselves with health care in America, as we have so many times since this century began. Indeed, when my guest today, Dr. David Blumenthal, first joined me here a dozen years ago as a distinguished Harvard Medical School professor of medicine and professor of health care policy, he discussed with me medical scientists and the marketplace, as well as the then seemingly much needed professional injunction, physician, prepare thyself. Well, now Dr. Blumenthal is president of the world-renowned Commonwealth Fund, a major national philanthropy heavily engaged in independent research on health and social issues. And in this first of two programs, I want to discuss with him his and historian James A. Marone's quite extraordinary new book on the heart of power, health and politics in the Oval Office. Clearly, other than war and peace, few issues have commanded our recent president's attention more than health care, their families, their own, most importantly, their fellow Americans. And I'm more than intrigued to learn that presidential scholar Richard Neustadt, my own late friend and colleague, indeed one of Open Mind's first guests when I began it nearly 60 years ago, played such an important role in focusing Dr. Blumenthal's attention on health and politics in the Oval Office. So that I would ask Dr. Blumenthal whether Dick Neustadt's expertise in the nuances of presidential power did indeed give him any particular insight into health policy and the Oval Office. Uh, thank you. Um, delighted to be here. Uh, Dick Neustadt was a towering figure in the history of understanding the U.S. presidency, and I was uh, a good friend and admired him enormously. And his interest in the presidency directly influenced my sense that there was a story to be told about how presidents lead at the national level in healthcare politics and policy. And it was that story that I and my colleague Jim Marone set about, set about to tell. Uh, and we were pleased to find that there was a story. One of the things that we were able to do, because I'm trained as a physician, is to incorporate, uh, thread into the story, the personal health histories of presidents and their families to try to see whether that was one special theme that was pertinent to this subject matter that might, might or might not be pertinent to many other issues that come before presidents. And your answer was yes, of course. Of course. And how did that work out? What did you well, see? Well, we saw that, of course, presidents vary enormously, but there were critical times in presidents' decision-making where they clearly were influenced by a personal experience. And one thing that's common to every human, whether they are poor and homeless or whether they sit at the height of power uh, in, the, in the known world, they all share a vulnerability to health problems and disease, and they all share families who have that vulnerability. And in a very personal way, presidents, just as anyone else, 
feels that vulnerability. So there were a couple of places where it clearly uh, played a role. Uh, and I remember, for example, very clearly an archivist at the Eisenhower Library asking me if I'd read a particular oral history uh, of a conversation between President Eisenhower and his then Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. And it was about his uh, wife, Mamie's uh, parent, who, uh, mother, who lived with them in the White House and was chronically and seriously ill. And there, when, I, when the archivist brought it out, was a story about uh, President Eisenhower reflecting on the pain and difficulty of his mother-in-law and the cost of illness associated with that kind of a long-term chronic illness. And after that, he actually turned to his Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare and said, I'd like to do something for the elderly. Now, this part of Eisenhower's tenure is rarely discussed, but in fact, there was an effort toward the end of his presidency to do something like Medicare. And he made that effort. He got badly beaten up by the American Medical Association and by the Republican uh, opposition to that kind of work, and he backed away from it. But it gave me a different insight into him as a man. Now, Edward, uh, Ted, not Ted Kennedy, but John Kennedy, had a similar experience after his father had a stroke, after Joseph Kennedy Sr. had a stroke. And this energized him to bring Medicare, health insurance for the elderly, before the Congress, unsuccessfully, as it turned out. But it energized him, and he reflected on that in conversations with his aide, Lawrence O'Brien. Uh, and in both those cases, there was a very direct relationship between a family illness and a presidential proclivity, a, a tendency, a decision that leaned in one direction as a, when it might have leaned in another direction. Of course, I saw that so much in the, your chapter on Richard Nixon. Yes, of course, that, uh, that's another very, very important uh, a relatively untold story. Uh, Richard Nixon, uh, his entire family was ravaged by tuberculosis. Uh, and Richard Nixon himself likely had tuberculosis as a child. Uh, there are uh, tantalizing hints uh, that as a physician I could kind of see in the, his description of his uh, childhood. But he lost a, a brother to tuberculosis. He wrote about it in very moving terms. Uh, in terms during his uh, childhood. And he referred to his experience and his family's experience with tuberculosis repetitively during his presidency. And as he resigned in disgrace, uh, the, the morning he left the White House, flying away in the, in the White House helicopter, he stood and addressed his staff and recalled his mother and her care for his dying brother who had tuberculosis. Uh, and uh, while he was nearly weeping over his personal fate, his thoughts gravitated back to this personal healthcare experience. Now, that mattered because he was actually an incredible advocate of universal healthcare. Uh, not commonly cited for that, but he put forward a bill that uh, was, in retrospect, more radical than President Obama's uh, proposal uh, now called the Affordable Care Act. As you look back, starting with Franklin Roosevelt, which of the presidents from you, whose activities you recount seem to you to be most important in bringing us to where we are today and later on or in our next program, I want to talk about mm -hmm. where we are today. Mm -hmm. Well, I came away most admiring as a president who can exert power and lead domestically, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Uh, he was without parallel in his ability to execute on a agenda in the healthcare space. And it, it was assumed that the passage of Medicare and Medicaid, which occurred after his election in 1964 by a landslide, that it was a virtual inevitability and that Johnson was an almost passive observer of this process that was run mostly from the Congress. And it turns out that that is the impression Johnson wanted to create. But behind the scenes, talking with his old colleagues in the Senate, talking with uh, his 
uh, colleague Wilbur Mills uh, on the House, that he was up to his ears in plotting and urging and strategizing about the passage of Medicare. He was not a man who could leave anything he cared about alone. Uh, he had to be in every detail. And it never struck me that it was plausible that the traditional hi history of Medicare, which is that Wilbur Mills kind of made it happen, could have, uh, could have unfolded the way it was told. And the, the reason I was able to see it past that appearance was because of the Johnson tapes. I wonder whether you feel that that's an indication that one has to be, as president, up to his ears or her ears, and in Johnson's case they were so huge, <laughs> to be successful, and how that relates yes. to the present scene. I think the president has to lead. The president has to be involved and conscious and planning and in charge. There's one thing that a president can do that no one else can do in the United States government or the United States as a whole. And that is communicate to the American people about health care and the policy needs to assure people access to health care. It's so interesting. You make that point about FDR, that he told his mm -hmm. uh, uh, disciples, I'm the one mm -hmm. who has to speak to the people. That's right. Why didn't he then? Sufficiently, as you, you know, it's a FDR is a mysterious president in many dimensions. That's often commented on by the classic historians of Roosevelt, and his mystery is very apparent in the healthcare area. Here was a man whose life was totally molded by personal illness. Actually, a man who was very involved in his own cure to the extent that cure was possible. He designed his own rehabil rehabilitation program for polio. Do you think that's the key? Is that it, he had to do it himself? Uh, it's, po it's part of the story. The part of the story is, I think, that Roosevelt um, had a, a very ambivalent relationship with the medical profession. Uh, I think he admired the medical profession, but he also had a healthy... Uh, no pun. Yeah, a, a healthy uh, skepticism which was well-earned because he was not well-treated by the profession. Misdiagnosed when his polio was uh, first occurred, misdiagnosed by multiple physicians, and then told that there was no possible way to rehabilitate himself and was set about to prove that, that, that they were wrong and was correct. Um, he, he was in some, in, in a way, the pioneer for what is now called rehabilitative medicine, which is a specialty, a well-respected well specialty of medicine. I think that in Roosevelt's case, there were many, as in all, all of Roosevelt's decisions, there were many streams feeding uh, his ultimate decisions. Uh, he was very worried about passing Social Security at the uh, time when it was most opportune for him to put health care in as part of the Social Security program. But he also had a very close relationship with his uh, son's father-in-law, a man by the name of Harvey Cushing. Harvey Cushing is a, one of the, the most eminent neurosurgeons uh, ever to walk the earth. Uh, there are uh, many uh, there are medical services named after him at leading universities. He was both at Harvard and at Hopkins. And Roosevelt put him as chair of a critical advisory committee in the 1930s, early 1930s. Cushing was quite conservative on issues of medical policy and uh, strongly advised Roosevelt against copying the socialist pattern that was then taking shape in Europe uh, with regard to national health insurance and universal coverage. I think that Roosevelt was, for his own personal reasons, unwilling to take on what was then the most powerful healthcare lobby, and that was the American Medical Association. And Harvey Cushing reinforced that hesitance. What do you think about your uh, colleagues in the profession and the role they have played uh, in terms of the rest of us and our health? Yes. Well, the, the medical profession, of which I am proud to call myself a member, uh, has many, many fine attributes. 
uh, and um, physicians go to work every day trying to do their best. When they get together collectively, they don't always act as altruistically as they are capable of acting individually. And they have, from the time of Roosevelt and before Roosevelt, until the present, and there's been some modification in their current uh, stands, stances on healthcare policy issues, but they have by and large been a force for the status quo, whatever the status quo was, and they have for the most part defended their financial interests rather than the interests of patients. And you feel that's the key? I think that has been a very, very important theme in their political stances. They do some wonderful things. They promote public health. They have now, they are important in the anti-smoking movement. Uh, they, uh, they do have many public spirited uh, endeavors. But when it comes to insurance, coverage, and payment, they tend to adopt self-interested and conservative stands. I'm particularly interested in um, your chapter on the second Bush, mm -hmm. President Bush. Um, your enthusiasm for him sort of, for me, flew in the face of my perception of his participation in social legislation. Yeah. I was wrong then. Well, I, I think you're wrong. From what we learned, uh, talking to the people who worked around him and experienced his input directly on what was the most important expansion of Medicare in its history, and that was the addition of the drug benefit for Medicare, so-called Medicare Part D. Uh, President Bush decided early to champion that. He stayed with it. He carefully planned its uh, had a position himself around its passage, and then lobbied vigorously and effectively for its passage. One of the things he did that uh, Obama was later criticized for, but I think was a correct position to take, is he didn't get too far into overt involvement in the passage. He laid out some principles, some guidelines, and then he turned it over to the Congress to shape the actual legislation, the details. Now that's what Johnson did with Medicare and Medicaid. It's what Clinton failed to do, uh, and it's what Obama did with success. My, one of the lessons we learned in watching presidents work healthcare issues over time was how important it is for them to set direction, elaborate principles, set guardrails, but not try to write every line of a piece of what will turn out to be extraordinarily complicated, extraordinarily complicated and controversial legislation. In, in your rules that you set down in, in, in this wonderful book about the heart of power, um, I'm very much amused at your blanket statement, don't listen to the budget people. That's right. <laughs> that was... Um, as someone who trained at the Kennedy School of Government, in part, mm. and had a lot of economists who were uh, my, my mentors and uh, who I respected, uh, we took that position with some uh, uh, kind of circumspection. But it is true that starting with Lyndon Johnson, going through Clinton, going th up through the Obama uh, experience, there's never been, as far as I can tell, an organized economic force within the White House, OMB, uh, Treasury, that has favored the extension of coverage to any part of the American public. And the rationale is almost always it can't be afforded. There's always a deficit to worry about. There's always an expansion that might be undermined or a, um, a, def or a depression or a recession that makes it uh, unwise to do it at any point in time. And uh, Johnson was able to get Medicare through because he ignored his economic advisors. Clinton ignored his economic advisors, otherwise he never would have advocated for health care. And Obama faced the same 
decision and also went forward with it. Now, uh, Johnson was successful, Obama was successful. Uh, the, other, uh, the other proponents of health care, like Clinton, <clears throat> now Clinton actually made the decision to address the economy before he addressed health care. And that was one of the reasons that uh, he failed. Well, uh, one of your rules is get in there quickly. And yeah. you quote Lyndon Johnson as saying to uh, his staff people after his election, I lose support every day yeah. now that the election is over. So, he so was you a want him to rush into it. Here was a man, Lyndon Johnson, who understood power better than, uh, as well as any president has ever understood power. He, in 1964, he was elected over Goldwater by an historic margin, a huge landslide. Uh, and if there was any time in American history when a president could have relaxed and, and uh, planned carefully for the enactment of the legislation he cared about, that was the time. And what did Lynch and Lyndon Johnson do? He got his staff together within a week and he said, we have to act fast, we have to act now. Every day I lose power. Every day I will make someone angry at me. Every day I will lose a vote. And that was only another example of what I think we saw repeatedly. Clinton's delay of, the, uh, of his health care legislation made it impossible to pass it. Uh, Obama's uh, didn't delay, but the waiting while Grassley and Baucus negotiated almost sunk the legislation because it enabled, it provided time for uh, Senator Kennedy to pass away and Senator Brown to be elected in his place with the loss of that 60 vote margin that was so important to the uh, Senate support. So uh, it was, uh, I think, a lesson that stands the test of time. This is one issue and in fact almost any presidential, real presidential priority has to be acted on within months of the president's first election. Yeah, but now I want to go back to the, um, to the other observation that you make. Stay away from the economists. Don't let them get their fingers into this pie. Aren't you saying that the kind of provision for the kind of medical care we need as a people is not affordable in terms of dollars mm -hmm. and cents. I get, I'd make a, a somewhat more complicated statement. I think our ways of accounting for the costs and benefits of health care do, uh, do not figure effectively the benefits. So we look almost always at the expenditure side. We never looked, look at the revenue side. The revenue occurs in terms of a healthier workforce, less absenteeism, more productivity at work, a population that's capable of learning uh, in school with healthy children or learning as adults, uh, a population that is more secure uh, in their lives and in their work. Let me give you a, a, an example from, the, from China. Uh, so the Chinese are very interesting because we think of them as a socialist country, but they have fashioned a healthcare system that is pure capitalism, unfettered capitalism. People pay out of pocket, they're now getting some insurance, but that's only about a three or four year, only three or four years old that the, con that the Chinese have had a conscious effort to extend insurance to their population. So why did they do this? Because there was no inclination to do it. The Chinese decided that they had to give everyone some protection against the cost of illness because people were saving so much money to deal with their health care expenses mm. that they weren't buying other goods and services. They couldn't build a domestic consumer economy as long as health care was not covered. So uh, I think that there are many calculations that go into the welfare that society reaps from universal coverage of health care that don't come up in the federal budget deficit calculations. Is that one of the um, calculations that the Commonwealth Fund can address itself to? Well, we are very interested in creating a high-performance health system and in the policies that are 
required to do that. And uh, we have had historically a deep interest in access to affordable insurance coverage and access to high quality health services, especially for vulnerable populations. And uh, we do believe, or we have in the past, valued the assurance that all people who need health care can get access to it. And we continue to pursue that. We're very interested, for example, in whether the Affordable Care Act can be effectively implemented and how it can be most effectively implemented and who will be left out. Because we know with a certainty that at least undocumented Americans, currently undocumented, will be left out of the benefits of the Affordable Care Act, sometimes called Obamacare. And we also expect that there will be individuals who, for economic or other reasons, uh, will choose not to participate uh, in, despite the penalties that would be imposed through the individual mandate. So we want to be aware of who is not included and who is included, and to make sure that the promise of the Affordable Care Act is realized. Dr. Blumenthal, that's the point at which I have to say that our time is almost up and get you to promise to stay where you are and let us do another program in which we do deal with Obamacare. Sure. Delighted. Thanks for coming here today. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. Meanwhile, as an old friend used to say, good night and good luck. And do visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to reprise this program online right now or to draw upon our archive of 1,500 or so other open mind and related programs. That's 13.org slash open mind. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.